and had John Tyson Carr from the University of Liverpool um, present his talk. John's fun fact is that he finished his PhD at 25. So well done, John. Um, go ahead, take it away. Okay. Um, can I just override if I share my screen? Yeah, here we go. Okay, so <coughs> everyone can see that, can't they? Perfect. Uh, so yeah, thanks everyone. Um, my name is John Tyson Carr. I'm a postdoc over at the University of Liverpool, and I work in the Visual Perception Lab. And I'm looking at how symmetry is processed in the brain, how the brain uh, perceives symmetry, and how it process uh, interprets that symmetry. And I'll just get straight into it. So visual neuroscience is concerned with how our brain processes the uh, visual input that is projected onto our retinas. Now we're constantly perceiving this really complex and 3D moving world and we need, our brain needs to be carrying out a series of complex processes in order to organize this input in a meaningful way for us to actually work with. And symmetry is one of those really important object properties that gives us work, uh, that provides us with a lot of information about the structure of the object. It's found to be an important determinant of mate selection, it's good uh, predictor of perceived beauty, preference, aesthetics, and it, um, it's, um, yeah, it, our brains actually got, it's important to the extent that our brains have actually developed and they do respond in quite a unique way to symmetry within the visual cortices. Now, when it comes to symmetry perception, um, if you think we have to integrate information quite from quite um, distant parts of our visual field. So if I was gonna give you an example, if you have a painting on a wall and it's got a really nice axis of symmetry right down the middle of that painting, and you don't find evidence for symmetry locally. You find it quite distantly across the image, usually a few centimeters apart. And if we look at some fMRI evidence for that um, accumulation of uh, that um, integration of information, we've got a paper by Sasaki et al. and Tyler et al. in 2005, and they find very little symmetry-related activity within V1 or V2, so early on in the visual stream. But we start to see symmetry-related activity emerging in V3 and it reaches the strongest in the LOC, the lateral occipital complex. And that makes sense because V1 and V2 have got very small receptor fields. But as we walk, go down that visual screen from, it, from V1 to V2 and then V3, V4, V7, we start getting bigger and bigger receptor fields. And that's why we start to get that integration uh, around about V3, and especially in the LOC. And what we also know is that these extra striate regions, so V3 and onwards, they generate what we can measure with EEG, something we refer to as the sustained posterior negativity, the SPN. And also that is, is essentially it's just a increased negative activity over posterior electrodes when people see symmetrical stimuli. So this is an example from North Sierra Town 2002. The blue line, blue line indicates what happens over posterior electrodes, that negative potential when people see symmetrical stimuli in comparison to random stimuli. And it's important to know that symmetry isn't, doesn't have to be this all or nothing concept. So if we look at this Palumbo et al. 2015 paper, if you take 100% symmetrical stimulus like this here, you can actually replace parts, uh, components of that image with random noise and decrease the proportion of symmetry within the image. So here you've got a 20% an image with 20% regularity and it increases in increments of 20%. And they found that actually this the, this SPN response actually increased in magnitude as the proportion of symmetry in the image uh, scaled up as well. And see here this bilateral negativity over the back of the head, which is quite, which is uh, characterized as the SPN response, increases in magnitude as the proportion of symmetry increases. And you can see it nicely in these difference waves as well. A really nice clean increase in that SPN response as the proportion of symmetry increases. This was replicated in another paper, making a tal 2020. Again, same, exact same paradigm. This is one of their experiments. It's the same protocol as the Palumbo et al. Scaling of that SPN response, increasing bilateral negativity as the proportion of symmetry increases. The exact same results. Now this data in making the tal 2020 is the data that I actually reanalyzed. Um, uh, it's, so it's over the past couple of months, in the absence of being able to collect new data, we ended up reanalyzing some data from making the TAL 2020. Now, they didn't just do that one task from Palumbo et al. That was just the first experiment within this series of experiments. And these five experiments all had 24 subjects, so 130 subjects across these five experiments. And the first task in the regularity discrimination task 
they saw a fixation cross, they saw a pattern, and then they made a binary decision between some regularity or no regularity. But in the other four tasks, they had to change what they, we changed what they were required to do. So we had the color discrimination task, and rather than the choice between regularity and no regularity, there was the choice between light or dark dots. In the other task, sound color congruence, they had to determine the congruence between the color of the pattern and the simultaneously presented sounds uh, in terms of pitch. Uh, they had to determine the congruence between the color of the pattern and the direction of a simultaneously presented arrow, like you can see down here, or just determine the distribution of the dots in the image. So what we essentially have is one experiment where people are required to attend regularity, attention towards symmetry, and another four tasks where attention is drawn to some other irrelevant stimulus dimension. And in terms of EEG pre-processing, it was a very standard pipeline. And just to reiterate here, you can see this is the first task that I showed you before. You get that scaling of the SPM response as the proportion of symmetry increases. We've got the four of the tasks as well. You can see a very similar pattern where we get the same increase of that SPM response as symmetry in uh, increases. Uh, so yeah, you get the same linear response despite attention being drawn to some other irrelevant stimulus dimension. But what we also note is that the regularity task, it looks like we get a much stronger response overall, but we also get this second little wave here uh, that isn't present in any of the conditions, and it's only actually present for the 100% and 80% reflection conditions. So that could be, be tempting to just think that was part of the SPM response, but it might be something else. It might be a separate cortical activation. Here, it's a bit easier to see. You get that scale increase in the regularity task, increase in the color distribution and so on. But that second peak at around about 600 milliseconds, it seems, you can see it doesn't really fit in with the SPN. It doesn't have that bilateral negativity indicating that it is a separate response and a, a separate EEG component characterized by a really strong positivity over the vertex of the scalp at around about 600 milliseconds. So what did we do in terms of reanalysis? We did source localization. Now, source localization just allows us to estimate the origins of the cortical the, the patterns we see across the scalp. So we'll, uh, and what we did was we used source dipole fitting, and we built a series of source dipole models that wanted to aim to maximally explain the data that we observed for each task individually. So for one model for each task, and we fitted the models uh, on the difference wave now between random and symmetry. So that is just a. Um, a waveform that is unique to symmetry, uh, symmetry related activity that we observe on the scalp. And we fitted the dipoles to minimize residual variance, or in other words, just to maximally explain the observed data. So we'd fit dipoles and try and explain the data as best as we can. And what we know from previous research is that that, bilat that bilateral negativity from the SPN is generated by a pair of uh, the two sources in the extrastriate region, so that visual stream V3 and so on, and the LOC pre predominantly. So what happens if we fit a model with just those two dipoles to see how well they can uh, explain the data? What we actually found was that just using those two extrastriate, those two visual uh, two dipoles within the visual cortex, that was enough to explain the vast proportion of the data is not well, as much as you could of the data in the final four tasks. But what we see here, this is the residual variance, or at least a summary of the residual variance. These four lines here represent the residual variance for the final four tasks where attention was away from irregularity. And you can see that there's not really any discernible uh, period of unexplained variance. It seems to be that those two dipoles can summarize the data really well. But what you can see from the, this line is the regularity task residual variance. There seems to be a extra cortical activation that is, that is um, not allowing the data to be explained by just those activations in the visual cortex. There seems to be at least one extra cortical activation, one extra component active during regularity discrimination. And if you look at the individual conditions, it actually seems to be specific to the 80% and the 100% regularity conditions, similar to what we saw on the, on the, the scalp maps on the left, a few slides ago. So yeah, this just suggests that there's one extra cortical source. So what happens when we fit, fit the full models? We fit, we, the regularity task required that we fit a third source within the posterior cingulate to explain the rest of the data. 
and it bumped up the residual explained variance from about 70 up to about 92 percent whereas the rest of the data models were the rest of the data sets were sufficiently explained by just extra striate extra striate sources so there seems to be a third source active during the regularity task that was required to be fitted and here's just a summary of the source waveforms and this is source uh, source waveforms just summarize the activity over time for each source for each dipole the left and right so ecd1 and ecd2 respectively i uh, seem usually show that same linear scaling with um, that we saw with the raw eeg data that scaling with proportion of symmetry but you can see on the third dipole here this is the posterior singular one it's only active between 400 and 800 milliseconds, peaking at 600 milliseconds for only the 100% and 80% conditions, not active for the other three conditions. And this mimics what we saw on the scalp maps, and it's what we expected from the residual variance, that there was an extra source active during those two conditions. And we fitted it on the Palumbo et al. 2015 data to see if this was just a fluke, and we observed the exact same results. You got that. 80 and 100% conditions requiring a third dipole within the posterior singlet to explain the data. So it wasn't just a fluke in one data set, it was observed across two completely different data sets taking years apart. So what can we take away from all this? Now, in the original manuscripts, both Palumbo and Making the Tarm, they found that the SPN, that sustained posterior negativity, that symmetry response, scaled with the proportion of symmetry in the image. In making the tile, they extended this to task whereby attention was uh, to symmetry was not actually required. So that SPN seems to be generated automatically. Symmetry seems to be perceived automatically. And when we reanalyzed the data, we found that there was actually an extra part of the brain that was active, an extra cortical source that was active when people viewed really strong symmetry, but only when attention was focused on discriminating symmetry. And if we wanted to push it one step further and we localized it, we found that it was uh, coming from the posterior cingulate. And what can we say about this just to have the takeaway message? So the extrastriate regions seem to communicate with regions outside of the visual cortex when discriminating regularity, but only when discerning extreme, when looking at um, really strong regularity. And this just kind of helps to discern both the perceptual and the cognitive aspects of symmetry discrimination. And that is everything. Thanks very much for listening, everyone. I think that was 12 minutes, so if we could have questions. Awesome. Thank you so much, John. So yeah, please feel free um, to enter some questions. I will abuse my um, position as MC and take the first spot. Um, I was wondering if you, um, your work or anyone else's that you've sort of touched upon um, has looked into relating this to like why symmetry is so pleasing. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. There's a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of research on like people just love symmetry. Um, I think it's something to do with the fact that it, evolutionary, you know, people often see symmetry, symmetry in the face, symmetry in the body as being attractive. I think it just implies order. Mm -hmm. I think evolutionary, there's quite a bit of research on um, the like the the specificity of symmetry and the reason that it's so important is evolutionary. It's what was it? I think it was something like um, it's a good indication of whether something is living or not living, and that might be why we find it so interesting. Okay, yeah, I hadn't um, heard that one. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, and then uh, I have one last question. I guess have you? Um, uh, I do sort of visual search stuff, and I'm wondering: is this ever been used sort of as a tool? Your uh, your point about how you have to take information from a really wide span in order to judge symmetry, has this been used um, to sort of look at, you know, how far into the periphery we're pulling um, information from, or has that been looked at? Yeah, um, off the top of my head, I've, you know, my, I've only been in position, so I, I work in decision making for this, and my visual literature is a bit shaky, but I do vaguely remember that if um, if you sit someone at a certain distance and separate image, uh, like um, certain patterns on the screen, various certain visual degrees apart, that information starts to not get integrated as well. Yeah, so I, I don't remember off the top of my head, but I think it as that, yeah, as it like, goes further apart, then the information isn't integrated as well. Yeah. Right. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, John. We are going to switch gears now and hear from.